All right, should I get started one minute early? All right, uh, let's get started then. So, um, hey everyone, uh, welcome to section. Um, this is uh, week two, and we're going to talk about ADTs and algorithmic complexity today. Okay, uh, just a quick intro. My name's Avery. Um, my normal sections are Thursdays, 1:30, 2:30, 1:30, 2:30. They're the only sections at a reasonable time when the sun is still out. Um, the 1:30 section every week is recorded, so. Um, if you want to watch me on high, super high HD, um, they're ne right next to the lecture videos. Okay, uh, feel free to email me at that email if you have any questions. Um, quick um, thing to note is um, if you have any questions, so here are all my sections. That's uh, for SCPD students and for other students. If you have any conceptual questions, th that's who you contact. If you have any questions about assignments, that's who you contact. Okay. Uh, quick note is if you're in a there's a little typo here, but um, yeah. Now, uh, assignment one is due at 5 p.m. Make sure you submit all three files, okay? So there are three, there are exactly three files you need to submit. Please submit those three files only. If you're submitting extensions, you can also add those in there. Don't submit the dot profile. Assignment two is due next Wednesday. So um, uh, it's word ladders and n-grams, and we'll actually be using all the ADTs we're gonna cover today, okay? It's a pretty cool assignment. Um, get started on it early. Now, I uh, just want to do a quick overview of the class. Uh, this class is called Programming Abstractions. I'll be honest, when I first um, saw this class, I didn't know what abstractions really meant. But um, you'll learn that um, these couple weeks we've been covering like basic C++ and ADTs. Starting week five to six, we'll be covering what's um, this unit called like implementing ADTs, where you actually implement some of these ADTs, which is, a pretty, which is one of my favorite things, OK? Um, this is a quick summary of like all the stuff we'll cover uh, in this class. Now, since uh, since this is probably the only time I'll have so many students here, I, I just wanted to um, promote this class called CS 106 L. Um, you'll sometimes some people ask me why do we cover the Stanford libraries in this class? Why don't you cover like the STL library C And the reason for that is because a lot of times what we the stuff we learned in this class is not C specific. It's relevant to any programming language that you learn. Okay, but if you do want to learn C++, if you do want to learn like what C++ is used in industry, uh, in the fall, I know not all of you are here in the fall, but in the fall I'm teaching a class called CS 106L. Uh, I spent the last two days making this, uh, making this roadmap of what we'll cover. One thing you'll notice is uh, Tyler just talked about operator overloading, and that's one of the things we'll cover down here in blue. Operator overloading, pretty cool. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's in the fall, and uh, we, we'll learn a lot of like modern C++ things. So one thing to note is we'll cover this thing called C++20. It's C++ that's going to be released in 2020. How cool is that? You'll learn stuff that hasn't even been released yet. So anyways, uh, yeah, that's just my, uh, my promotion. Any questions? Uh, if you're not here in the, over, over the fall, uh, they'll also be online, so you can feel free to uh, take a look at slides, take a look at videos, and we'll be sharing those as well. Anyways, uh, other than that, let's get started with sections. So section today we'll be covering uh, ADTs, and um, we're going to do a quick warm up, or just basically go over that chart that we just filled out. Uh, then we're going to do a stack queue trace, a stack queue code, uh, map and set code, and then uh, we'll talk about big O notation. Uh, that's a challenge problem over there that we'll cover at the end. Cool. Okay. So warm up. Let's see. All right. Any questions at this moment? Okay, so let's just quickly go over this, uh, this table right here, okay? This is a table that um, you don't have to memorize, but probably by the end of assignment two, you'll have this like pretty much memorized, okay? Uh, okay, so let's just quickly fill this in row by row. So for vector, um, what did you put for this row? So what's the key feature of a vector? Yes? It's linear, you can access all parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's yeah. Linear. Yeah, awesome. Uh, yeah, so the vector, the key feature is uh, it's essentially like a one-dimensional array, but like more fancier, right? Um, yeah, some, something that you mentioned was you can access all parts. That's something that we call random access. You can essentially, I don't know why they call it random, but it's essentially you can, you can just choose any index and you can access it, okay? So yeah. Um, what's also important is this part called indexed. Uh, vectors are like one of the only things where you can give it an index and it tells you exactly, okay, um, at index three, here's the element. Right, you can't do that for any other collection. Um, let's see, adding, in the, adding and removing in the back is O of one, otherwise it's O of n, uh, assignment and access O of one as well, okay? Cool, uh, what about stacks? 
Uh, yes. You can only access the top of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for a stack, kind of like a like a stack of trays, you can only access the the, the top one, right? Cool. Um, what about um, so about like random access and in, in indexed? Is it yes or no? No, right? Because you can only access the top one, so there's no way you can access any other elements. Um, how? What's the the big O of uh, accessing from the top? O of one. O of one. Yeah, O of one. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of the reason why we like using stacks um, instead of like vectors or something. Because um, for the if you only want to access the front, you can just um, use the methods and it's O of one. Cool. Uh, how about queues? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, first in, first out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. First in, first out. So anything you put, the order in which you put it, stuff into the queue is the stuff you get it out of. Um, what's the efficiencies? The all, all one. Yeah. Also all one. Okay. Awesome. All right. Grids. We, we use this a lot in game of life. Yeah. It's like a two-dimensional random access stack mm -hmm. of ADT. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, awesome. Um, grids are, sometimes people like to call them like oh, two-dimensional vectors. You, you, it's kind of like a vector within a vector. Um, that's almost correct. Um, there is one small difference, and that's for a grid, you can just randomly insert like, a, like, an, like an, uh, an element into the, the grid. Right. If you insert an element, that kind of messes up the columns and the rows. So there's no way to like e easily to just insert something. You can resize a grid, right? For this, for a game of life, you did resize grids, right? But you can't just randomly insert grids. Okay. Cool. And um, I was just sitting over there looking uh, looking at Tyler's lecture. This is a great time to review what maps and sets are. So maps. What's special about maps? Yes. Um, they have. They store two elements, um, and they're indexed by the key. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. So they store key value pairs. All right. Yeah. So um, yeah. So th th that's what we call associative. We call these like associative containers. They associate a key with a value. Okay. Um, let me quickly talk about this uh, random access. Yeah, S technically some people don't call this random access. What I mean by random access is just if you have a key, you can easily get the value. Okay. Um, let's see. Adding and removing assignments. Um, these are log n. You might wonder why why the heck did do logs appear? You'll learn this in week five. Okay, but for now, just trust that um, accessing and removing elements are log n. Log n is pretty fast, right? If n is a billion, log n is pretty still pretty small compared to n. And then how about sets? Yeah, no, no duplicates, and also you—it's kind of like a map, but you don't have—you um, you don't have values. Yeah, so no, no duplicates. And the key thing we want to—we use sets for is for membership. Is something in a set or it's not something not in a set? Okay. So this this table, um, hopefully, uh, you are sort of familiar with this table right now, and um, by next week you'll have this table fully ingrained in your. Yes. Question. Oh, um, I don't know actually. Um, I can probably if you make a post on Piazza, I'll, I'll link you to to this PowerPoint or something. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. Cool. So um, now let's do a stack and queue trace. Uh, I'm I spent like a lot of time making a lot of slides for this, so I hope you enjoy it. Um, take a look at question two on the handout. Okay. All right. So if you look at question two, you'll you'll see that it's essentially there's a there's a um, there's a little program, and then we're essentially going to pass in a stack one two three four five six. Um, I think six is the top of the stack. Okay. So if you pop from the stack right now, you get six, and then we're also going to pass in n equals three. And the goal is to essentially trace what happens in um, in this program. Okay. You'll notice that there are four while loops here. So what I want to do is uh, I want to give you just around 30 seconds for each while loop. Trace through what happens in each while loop. And then when you're done, ask, um, compare with a partner or something and see what you got. And then we'll actually trace through it once. Yes, question? Is this number one or number two on the handout? Uh, this is question two, but then there's like a subpart one. Yeah. Okay, we only do subpart one. And then for midterm practice, you can do subpart two.
All right, how are we doing? Uh, who's done with, with, uh, this, with the first loop? OK, I'll give you 30 more seconds. All right, let's, um, let's try tracing through this together, OK? We're only going to trace these three lines, and we're going to see what happens. All right? Um, let's see. So first, um, we enter the while loop. What happens here? Stack dot size. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It'll compare the size of the stack to n, which is 3. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that evaluates to true. So that means we enter the, the, the loop itself. Now, stack dot pop, we just pop from the stack. Uh, what's the, if you pop from the stack, what element do you get? Six. Six, yeah. I kind of uh, arranged it like this. So Q, it kind of makes intuitive sense. You're moving forwards. For a stack, you're moving from the top and the bottom down. OK? So we, we pop six off. And then what happens in this line? Q's it up in the queue. Yeah, so that, that six, we're going to enqueue that into the queue. So the six over here moves into the queue. OK? Is everyone with me so far right now? OK, what happens in the next iteration? Yes? size is 5, mm -hmm. and it's 5 still more than 3, so mm -hmm. you're going to pop the stack and move it to the end queue, so the queue is going to have 6, 5 now. Yep, awesome. OK, and then just, just one more iteration. Um, similar, something similar happens. Size is still 4, so we pop from, from 4, and we end queue that into 3. OK, now something happens when you reach, um, when you reach this point. Stacks.size right now is 3, right? So this for loop is done, and we are done with this little segment. OK, any questions? OK, um, let's see. I'll give you like 30 more seconds. Try tracing through the second one. This is a little bit more involved, but um, let's see how we do. All right, who's done? OK, 30 more seconds. If you're done, feel free to move on to the next loop. All right, so even if you're not fully done with the whole loop, I uh, you hopefully got through like one iteration. Um, let's, let's try to trace through one iteration and then um, hope, see if that gets you unstuck, and then we can keep going, OK? So um, what does this line do? Yes? To see if the first stack is empty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it, is not, uh, it is not empty. So we're going to pop from uh, the stack, which just gives us an element three. Now, what happens in the next two lines? Uh, go go ahead. Yeah. Um, so it's gonna add this element that you saved into the stack two. Uh -huh, yeah, stack two. So we're gonna push that into stack two. And then if the element is also divisible by two, like easily divisible by two, if it's an even number, it's gonna add it to the queue. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, is is three divisible by two? No. It's not. So uh, so we just skip the for loop and we go to the next iteration. Okay. Does that make sense? All right, uh, let's try to trace one more iteration. So we pop, we push the element. But now, because this next element 2 is divisible by 2, so we push it into the, the queue. OK? All right, and then um, since it's, this, it's something similar, let's just quickly go through it. We pop the element out, we push the element into the stack 2, and then it's not divisible by 2, so we skip that. OK? How, how are we doing so far? OK. 
third loop. We're almost there. 30, uh, 30 seconds should be fine. If you had to give me a one sentence pseudocode for this loop, what would it be? Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead. Take the queue and like, put it in the stack. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So essentially, take the, the queue, is it? Yeah, take the queue, just move all the elements in the queue into the stack in order. Yeah, so um, we can just quote, trace to the loop, but that is exactly what the loop does, right? It, while it's not empty, so we're going to keep going until the queue is empty. We're just going to uh, dequeue and then push it into the stack. So one, two, three, and there we go, four. All right? Yeah, sometimes it's a little tedious to trace through every single operation. So you sometimes just might want to look at the whole thing and like, OK, if I had to turn this back into pseudocode, what would it look like? OK, does that make sense? OK, we're almost there. Uh, one more. And uh, try to, it looks really similar. Try to do the same thing. If you had to give a one sentence pseudocode for this loop, what would it be? Take for a moment, think for 20 seconds. All right, well, what would your one sentence be? Uh, go ahead. Stack two to stack one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're just going to pop stack two, and we're just going to move all the elements to stack one. Okay, so we, um, let's see, while it's not empty, we pop the one, and we move it to the, to the stack, pop the two, move it to the stack, pop the three, move it to the, to the stack. Okay? So at the very end, we see out this whole stack. Now, um, if, if this was on the exam, and uh, you reach this last tab, don't, don't, don't mess this up. What order does it print the, the stack in? Go ahead. Top down. Top down? Is it top down? I think, be, um, let's see, I'm not. I think it's from the bottom up, right? Because uh, if, if you looked at the, the, the thing that it was passed in, it was one, two, three, four, five, six. So I think six is at the top of the, of the stack. Yeah, so we actually print from like six, five, four, two, one, two, three, like this. OK? All right, any questions? All right, so yeah, this is a pretty typical uh, midterm question. Uh, you'll probably see one of these on the exam. When you see one of these, I, what I suggest you do is, um, is just break the problem down into like different loops. You'll probably see a lot of different loops. And then um, essentially keep track of your work of what is at each loop so that it's easier for you to, to double check your work, OK? Yeah. It's kind of hard to get partial credit on these questions, to be honest, because if you mess up one part, it kind of messes the whole program up. So be extra careful when you do these. All right, uh, try part two on your own uh, before the midterm, obviously. OK, any questions so far? OK, let's go to um, the, the, a coding question. OK, so um, we have the option between um, question three and question four on the handout. Question three is called reorder, and I really like that question, so we're going to do that one. Uh, question four is called check balance. Um, the, the, it's a really good question, and I encourage you to do this on your own time. This is how, like, um, like compilers, how how they check if you have a uh, unmatched brace, right? You've coded in Java or C plus plus. You, you know how um, if you have like an unmatched brace, it like turns red in Qt. Yeah. So how it checks is uh, it does something like that, where you can kind of use a stack to model um, to make sure that the parentheses are balanced. Okay. So do that question on your own time. Otherwise, uh, we're going to do this reorder question. The reason why I like this question is it's kind of like a puzzle. All right. So uh, let's quickly look at the question, and uh, I'll and hopefully that will make sense. Uh, here's a diagram. All right. So you're given a Q, which looks like that. The front is the one, and the back is uh, the negative 34. Now, currently the Q is in increasing order of uh, absolute value. So you notice that if you took the absolute value of all these, you get uh, an increasing order. But because there are some negative signs, they're not in like c the correct order. And what you have to do is you have to reorder it so that it looks like this down here, okay, where it is an actual increasing order. 
This is, this is kind of like a puzzle because, uh, I mean, it, it sounds easy in principle, but the issue is because you're, this is a queue. So you can't just randomly pick elements in the middle and move them around. So you have to figure out a, a strategy to move these around, OK? Uh, to make our lives easier, let's, let's allow you to use a second queue, OK? So before, the question was you can only use a single stack. But let's add, uh, to make it easier, let's let us use another queue, and then we'll see how we can fix that, OK? If, if a problem is too challenging, loosen the, the restrictions a little and see what you can come up with. So right now, you can use both a stack and a queue. All right, talk with your partner, try to figure out what kind of strategy you would use to, to do this, okay? It's kind of like a logic puzzle as well. Yeah, this lecture hall is a weird place to do section, but um, feel free to scooch around, talk with people. If you're unsure, I suggest how to approach this question is don't think about stacks and queues yet. Just think about how would you do this intuitively. How can you uh, take the elements and reorder them? Okay. Yeah, that's a good strategy because then we can try to intuitively understand why might stacks and queues be helpful. If you're a little stuck, here's a little hint. All right, if you just focused on the positive integers, what do you notice? In yeah, they're in increasing order, right? Okay, how about if you focus on the negative ones? Uh, oops. They're in decreasing order. Okay, how might that be helpful? All right, should we try discussing this? Thumbs up, thumbs down. OK, but let, let's start discussing this. So what might be a strategy to start um, given that observation? Yes? Um, so you can, if the number is positive, uh -huh. you want to uh, put it back in the, in the back of the queue. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's negative, you want to put it on the stack. Mm -hmm. And then when, um, and then fill in the in this the queue from the stack. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, that's the like basically the, our final answer, uh, which is great. Let's try to intuitively understand uh, how, how we got to the answer. Okay, yeah, but you're completely right. That is the the the, the answer we'll reach at the end. Um, before we get to like actual stacks and queues, let's try to intuitively understand like how you might rearrange these numbers. So one thing you might do is okay, well. The positives and the negatives are kind of annoying, uh, intertwined together. Let's separate them out, right? So if we separate them out, that looks like this. Uh, let's correlate all of them to one side. OK, if you had these, how, how could you uh, finish the problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I saw you did something like this, where you essentially re reverse the negatives, and then we put the negatives back into the front, right? OK, so given this, why might we use um, why might we use stacks and queues? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because 
because stacks are last and first out, that gives you like an easy way to reverse something. Right? If you need to reverse something, just add them onto the stack, and then when you, um, when you pop them out, it comes back in reverse order. So that suggests why, this, why in this problem you might want to use a uh, stack. Okay? Um, and then the, for the positives, because we don't actually change the order of the positives, that suggests that we use a queue for the positives. Okay? Does that kind of make sense? All right. So uh, let's try to go through this one more time, see if we can turn this into like a more concrete code. So um, let's see. Stacks. So to separate out the, the negatives, um, uh, as you mentioned, one way we could do this is we could put the negatives into a stack and the positives into a queue. Okay. Well, why might we put the negatives into the stack? Yes. Because we need to reverse the negatives. Yeah, because the negatives are the ones we want to reverse, right? So one. So that's why we intuitively want to put the negatives in, into the stack. All right. Um, so. As, as you mentioned, I think we already mentioned this, where to, re to reverse the negatives, one way you can do that is you can pop all, um, you can put them into the stack and then just pop them out. That gives you the negatives in reverse order. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, and then uh, how might you put the negatives in front of the positives? This is kind of hard to understand because we don't have a diagram, but um, one way to do that is you can just dequeue from the queue. The queue has all the positives and just put them back into our original queue. Okay. Okay. Let's try to see this in action. So just to make sure that, that this all works. So um, to separate all the negatives, what we could do is we could put put the negatives into the stack, the positives into the queue. Okay. You can quickly trace this out. You get something like this. Okay. So all the positives are in the queue. The negatives are in the stack. Now we want to reverse the negatives. Oops. We want to reverse all the negatives. So we did what we exactly said, where we just pop from the we can just pop from the stack and put them back into our queue. So pop, 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 pop. All right, and then here, how can we move the negatives in front of the positives? Or the positives back to the back of the negatives? Yeah, we can just dequeue from the queue and just put them into the stack, into the, the other queue. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, um, I know the problem said we cannot use a second queue. I just want to intuitively understand, like, okay, suppose we were we were allowed to use another queue, then this is like one pretty uh, straightforward way to solve it, right? We can just put the negatives into the stack, positives into the queue, move all the negatives back into our original queue, and then move all the positives to back into the queue. Okay. Okay. So if you were like completely stuck on like a, a problem on an assignment on an exam, uh, one way to do it is just to think intuitively how you would do it, and then try to match that to okay, how is that helpful using our ADTs right now? Okay, stacks are really helpful for reversing elements, so that's why we might use a stack here. Okay, uh, do you want to try to code this up, or do you want to just skip to uh, how can you solve this without using a, a second queue? Do you want to just skip? Okay, cool. So now, now we just don't use another queue. All right. Let's see. Let's think about how we can solve this problem without using another queue. Okay. So currently, our first step is to move all the negatives into the stack, positives into the queue. But we don't have another queue. How can we solve this without using another queue? Um, yes. Oh, sorry. Are you raising your hand? No. Uh, yes. <laughs> Put them into the back of the same queue. Yeah, yeah. So exactly, because we can't use another queue, why don't we just reuse the queue we have right now? Okay. Uh, let's see. So if we just ran through this once, it's one, one. We move to the back. Negative two. We move to the stack. Four. We move to the back. Five. We move to the back. It's negative seven. Negative nine. Negative twelve. Twenty-eight. Negative thirty-four. Okay. This does pose one small issue. Can, can you see what the small issue is? Can't add to the front. Um, that's that, that. That might be an issue later on. But right now, as we're doing this step, we might run into an issue. Yes. Our queue is current. Our queue is reversed. Uh, yes. We will solve that next. But um, one issue that you see right now. Yes. Uh, we'll we'll just keep we'll be in the loop. Yeah. Now we go to Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, yeah, both of the questions you mentioned, we'll try to solve that later. But right now, even just in this step, there's a problem. And that's, as we're trying to do this uh, procedure, we're trying to move all the negatives to the back of the queue, positives to, move, sorry, other way around, move the positives to the back of the queue, the negatives to, the, to into the stack. We don't actually know when we're done. 
right? Before, we can easily check when we're done when the queue is empty. But because we're reusing that queue, right, the queue won't ever be empty. So how do we know when to stop? I can think of two ways to do this. Um, what's your method? Uh, the, before going into the loop for dequeuing, I'd save the size of the queue and then have a counter in the loop. And when the counter gets above the size of the loop, um, that's when we know, know to quit. Yeah, great. Yeah, that is um, that is def that is the easier of the two methods I, I thought of. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So one way we could do this is notice initially when we go back here, right? There are nine elements. There are nine elements right now, and we're going to process each element one at a time. Okay. And we're just going to process each element once. So one thing you could do is you could save. Okay. We save the size right now. We have nine elements, and then just repeat this process nine times. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And we know when, when that's done, we'll have all the positives in there, all the negatives in there. OK? Yeah, question? Yeah, uh, the other way uh, is a little bit more complicated, I guess. It's, um, it's as you're going through this, OK? Um, let's see, the other way would be you would keep going through this, and you'll calculate the absolute values. And then whenever you see, so like here, the absolute value is 7, absolute value is 9, absolute value is 12, absolute value is 28, absolute value is 34. And then when, when the next element has a sudden drop in absolute value, then you know that, then you know that you're back at the positives, right? Because the original queue was in increasing absolute value order. That's one way you could do it, but why not just save this, the queue, the, the size of the queue into one, OK? Yeah, so um, that's one way we could do it. Any questions? OK, so yeah, uh, one, so here we can just record the size of the queue n, and then we just repeat this process n times. OK, do we have to do anything to change our second step? If we just did this, we would get negative 34, 12. Is that still workable? OK, we're almost done, because at this last step, how can we rearrange that thing over there? How can we rearrange that queue to get the right answer? Anyone else? Any ideas how we can rearrange this queue to get the right answer? Yes? You queue the positive ones and then put them back. Yeah, exactly. So right now, the positives are just in front of the front of the negatives, but they're in the right order within the positives. So you can just DQ. Um, oops. Yeah. So we, we can just DQ and then NQ all of those back. All right. We will face one more issue again, kind of similar to how um, how we don't know when we're done. Right. Uh, how can we keep track of when we're done? As before, there are two ways to do this as well. Anyone? Yes? Before you enqueue all the things from the stack, you can count how many positive numbers you have mm -hmm. in yeah. Just mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because notice here, um, when we have all the positives, we know exactly how many positives we have. So we could just save this number over here before we do the popping. And then now we know that there's exactly four things we want to move to the back. OK? So um, here, we can just count the number of positives. We can do that by, before popping, we save like some size m, which is the size of the q with only the positives. Then we know to do repeat this four times to um, dq and nq four times. OK? Does that make sense? OK, let's try coding this up. Should be pretty fast. Uh, no. Oh, there we go. OK. By the way, there's this website called Code Step by Step, and it's a really nice, um, nice website where um, you can essentially write code directly in here, and then it will also run like test cases for you. OK? On your assignments, you should be writing your own test cases, but uh, if you just want like a quick coding practice, here is a good way to do it. All right? So let's try to quickly code this up. I have the pseudocode from the presentation over here. Um, let's see. How can we convert this step 1 to 8 into code? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Q dot size. Q dot size. Yeah. So uh, Q dot size that gives us the size of the Q, and then let's just store this into um, we call this n. So I'm just going to call it n. 
All right. Okay, how do we do this part 1b? Uh, yes. Um, just a for loop. Mm -hmm. um, so for int i equals zero, i less than n, i plus plus. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah. And then how would we put the negatives into the stack positives into the queue? Um, so then if mm -hmm. um, q dot uh, dq is less than zero, um, then it goes to the stack. So stack dot push. Okay, so let's see. If uh, if it's a negative, then go into stack. So Q. Um, oh, we, we don't have a stack yet. So we declare stack up here. S dot push. What do we push? Uh, Q dot DQ. Q dot DQ. Like this? Okay. And then else if. Um, or just else. Let's see. If it's zero, well, what do you do if it's zero? Mm. I guess it, I guess it doesn't matter where you put the zero. So uh, else. So we can just do else. So if it is positive, then. Oops. If it is positive, then. Okay. So if it's positive, then go back into Q. Okay. The, yes. But DQ in the test statement, DQ. Mm -hmm. So you need to use a peak there instead. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, this is almost right. There's one small thing over here, which is when you call DQ, that yeah, that element is already um, DQ'd and lost. Uh, question? So am I in the right class? Uh, what class are you? Is this? I'm thinking CS106AP. No, so this is CS106B section. This is CS106B section, so probably not in the right room. Yeah, I have section in here, so I'm not sure about that. Okay, so uh, yeah, so we can uh, change this. We can just change this to uh, peak. Okay, how peak and DQ are different. DQ, uh, DQ is the element like um, permanently, and then what peak does is it kind of looks at the first element, but it doesn't actually take it out. Okay, cool. Um, okay, yeah, so no, no, this is really interesting. We don't often see this where um, to like go through a queue or go through a stack. Oftentimes we use the like the while not empty, you do that, right? Sometimes you, you just want to process all the elements once, in which case a really common thing you'll see is that you save the size and then you just do a for loop across that size exactly once. Okay, that prevents you from going in like an infinite loop if you have to NQ and then if you have to DQ and then put the thing back in. Okay. Let's do um, it's part two A. I'm just going to do this. We just record the size with only the positives. So at this point, we only have positive. So let's see, so Q dot size. OK, how do we pop all the negatives and NQ into the result queue? Yes. This would be a while loop. Mm -hmm. And while uh, s is not empty. Mm -hmm. While s, oops, s is. Um, empty. Then s pop uh, is empty. Okay, so s dot pop, that pops the element. Or q dot nq s dot pop. Yeah, so, and then we nq that element in q. Okay, great. Yeah, so in this example, in this case, we do want to use a while loop because we want to keep doing it until the, the stack is empty. All right, we're almost done. How do we DQ and then re enqueue all the positives? Yes? We can use a for loop now for mm -hmm. the M that we said, and then for like M. M sure. And then in the for loop, we would um, DQ, we would NQ the DQ M times. Sure. Um, q dot nq, and then we so we nq and then we dq and then immediately nq it back in. Exactly. Okay. And the nice thing about this is um, it even plays the sound. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, further, like next week or probably uh, we'll do, we'll be doing recursion. And usually when I do recursion, the first thing you'll hear is bam, because it will say oh something doesn't work, but um, it worked the first time this time. Okay, any questions so far?
Okay, we have 10 minutes. Let's, let's see how far we can get. Um, let's go back to here. So uh, let's do one more question about maps. Okay, this is a really similar question to the one that we just did in lecture. All right. So this question is uh, it's called friend list. It's a pretty um, standard map question where uh, I'll just show you what the what the expected stuff looks like. Uh, if you are given a file which looks like that, so it essentially shows all pairs of people who are friends. Okay. Uh, unlike most friendships, uh, the friendships are always bidirectional here. So uh, if Tyler is a friend of Kate's, then Kate is a friend of Tyler's. All right. And then what you want to do is you want to essentially process this entire file uh, and then create a map, which essentially shows each person and their list of friends. Okay. Okay. One thing to think about here is what is um, what data structure should this thing down here probably be. A map, okay, yeah. So this should be a map because you're associating um, a person with all their friends. Uh, what should the key be? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, okay, so a string. Yeah. String. Well, the value should be a set if they have numerous friends. Yeah, great. Uh, so a set of strings. Uh, why a set rather than like a vector? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, because you only want. You only want to we only want to have one person or like mm -hmm. one instance of the friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because um, potentially the file could contain Tyler K and then uh, maybe Tyler K again or something. So um, just to avoid that, we're going to use a set so there's no repetitions. Okay. Cool. Let's try coding this up. This is a really short example. So oh, I keep pressing escape. I don't need to press escape. Um, okay. Let's see. Friend list, and the answer is here. So let's quickly. Do that. Okay, so um, let's do just do really quick pseudocode. So we're given a file name. How can we solve this problem? What's the first step? Yeah, as a hint, we have the file name. We don't actually have a file yet. So open the file. What do we do after we open the file? Yeah, go ahead. We can make a map, but we don't have people in there, so maybe we need like, yeah, we can make our map then. Okay, sure. Uh, we can also make, just make the map at the beginning. That's a good point. Let's just make the map. Um, let's call it friends. Okay. Yes? You go like line by line, mm -hmm. and then in each line you have to break the words apart. Yep, so let's see. Break, uh, read line by line, and then um, we want to essentially find uh, the, the two people. So let's call them person A and person B. And then what do we do with person A and person B? So person A is the key, and then B is like, let's add, let's add B to that piece set. Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, add person A to person B's friend list. Add person B to person A's friend, friend list. OK. Cool. Um, anything else? All right. Yeah, go ahead. Can I have to count for like, if like, Mar like Marty has like two friends, Cynthia and Danielle, so person B kind of, like, would have to have like, something to figure out how to differentiate between two people. Um, differentiating between two people. You mean like when they have the same name? Or? Oh, not the same name. Like, isn't there two people for Marty? Like, he has two friends, or do we not have to look at that? Oh, oh, it has two friends. So um, I think what happens is uh, Marty. So Marty appears on this line. So when we first go, th when we first read this line, Cynthia will be added to Marty's friend list, and then when we go to the second line. Danielle will be added to Marty's friend list. So at the end, we will get Marty will have two friends. Okay. All right. Yeah. This is pretty straight. Um, pretty short. Let's try to turn this into code. How do you open a file? I give you a hint. It starts with an I. If stream. if stream, yep, if stream. Some people say if stream, right? Okay, I, I, I always thought it was like if, if something, then you get a stream, but it's, uh, I think it's input file stream. If stream file, and then um, how do you open a file? Okay, so there's actually two ways you can do it. I prefer this. Yeah, there's two ways you can do it. I prefer to do it this way. When you declare it, you also just pass in the file immediately. That way you don't even have to open the file. It does it for you. Okay, yeah. 
Um, okay. Uh, if you take 106L, you learn this concept called RAII, which is a good C++ programming thing. But um, yeah, we, we essentially just open the file here, so we don't have to explicitly call open. All right, how do we read line by line? One way we could do this is we could do string line and then while uh, file line, right? No, nope, not that. We can do get line, like get line, file line, right? That's one way we could do it. But notice that in this example, we want to read, we don't really want to read line by line. We want to read token by token, right? If we read the whole line, well, then we have to do some like string processing to split out who the first person is, who the second person is. Is there a way we can do this so that we get like the two people in two separate variables immediately? Yeah? So they can use the separates each string and get line to like different spaces mm -hmm. on its own. Sure, that's called string split. Uh, we can definitely do that. Um, there's a simpler way, if you just want to read tokens from a file, there's a simpler way, an even simpler way to do it. Yes? Did you just use the input? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I kind of hinted at that. Uh, remember that this reads like one token. And then what's cool is you can chain them. So I'm going to do person A, person B, and I'm just going to chain them. Read the file into person A, and then when you're done with that, then immediately read into person B. Okay, yeah, it's pretty cool. You can chain them like this. Um, if if any of these fail, then the while loop stops. Okay, cool. So this reads it line by line. It reads the person into, it reads the, the people like Marty into person A and Cynthia into person B. Okay, Qu question. Word by word. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. When you do the uh, the two, uh, it goes word by word. Helpful for assignment two. Okay. Cool. Um, how do we add into the friend list? Yes. Um, so if we're adding person A to person B, then you can have um, person. You can do the key would be person B's name, mm -hmm. and then you would add. A string person A. Mm, yeah, so um, just like in uh, kind of like in lecture, you do, uh, we can access person A and then we set or we don't set, this gives us the set associated with person A and then we add that to, we add person B to that set. Okay, I personally prefer this way, just do the plus equals person B and then we do something similar. Person B plus equals person A. Hi. Um, okay. All right, one small note is um, remember this concept called auto, not auto insertion, uh, default values, right? Why doesn't this crash when, uh, when um, person A is not in the file? Yes? The default value for a string is just an empty string. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. so um, when, when that happens, not the empty string though, um, when it creates it, it creates like the empty set, right? And then it adds it to the set, okay? So if you run this, uh, okay. Person A, return friends. It works. There we go. Okay. All right. We have uh, two. We have two minutes. Let's quickly just do um, my last uh, big O, big O notation. Okay. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but um, the key things to note is if your code is sequential, you want to. If it's like one loop followed by the other, then you add the big O's. If if it's um, one nested in the other, then you calculate what the runtime is of the, of the inner loop and also uh, how many times it's run. So take a look at this example and try to figure out what its big O is. Actually, we don't have much time. Well, let's just walk through it and then uh, let's just walk through it and um, answer some questions, okay? So one thing I often suggest that you note here is sometimes when you have a while loop, you don't actually know how many elements are in there. So what I'd like to do is before you start anything, just go through the code once and figure out how many elements are in V when you get to that point. So in there, there are n elements in V, okay? That will help you when, uh, when you're trying to calculate how many times the loop runs. That will help you a lot, okay? All right, so insert. What's the big O of insert? N. O of n, right? So this becomes O of n. And how many times does this loop run? N times, right? So we repeat n times. When you have nested code, you multiply how, many, how long the code takes times the number of times it's repeated. So this becomes n squared, okay? Similar to the other one, um, v dot remove, o of n, how many times is the loop repeated? Oops, how many times is the loop repeated? 
n, okay? Then this is why the, the comma is important, because sometimes you don't actually know how many elements are in there. There could be O of n squared elements or O of 1 elements. But here we know exactly there are n elements, so this repeats n times, so it's O of n squared, okay? Uh, one more example. Um, okay, so here, this is, this is where the comma is important, because notice that we're going to add n squared elements into the stack. So we put a short comment there. This stack has n squared elements. Okay? All right, what's the big O of push? O of 1. Uh, how many times does the loop run? O of n squared. So what's the big O of, the, of that chunk of code? O of n squared. Okay? Uh, what's the big O of this code over here? This is tricky. So stack.pop is 1. What's the big O of adding to a set? Yeah, the answer is log n. Okay, remember adding to a map or set is log n. So what's the big O of that code? Log n. Okay, and then how many times does the loop run? n squared times. So what is the big O of this little segment? n squared log n. Okay, kind of odd. Okay, if you combine them, what's, what's, what happens when you combine all these? n squared log n. Okay, pretty, uh, kind of a weird example. All right. Uh, if you had time, uh, you might want to look at that code example. That one is really tricky. Uh, it was given, like, it was a midterm question uh, some time ago. Out of, like, 400 students, I think 10 people got it right. <laughs> yeah, that's a really tough question. Um, uh, take a picture of it or something, and you can ask me, um, you can ask me what the answer is, because that one is just really tricky. Okay? Cool. Uh, we're, we're basically done. Um, I kind of want to talk about this, but... This was mentioned, this idea was mentioned um, on Tuesday, I think, where insert is usually O of n, right? But don't just blindly memorize, oh, insert is always O of n. You want to think about how many, like, where you're inserting, right? If you're adding, like, adding is O of 1, so inserting, um, let's see, these inserts are O of n. But if you're inserting to the back, that's O of 1. If you're inserting to, um, to a constant number, at the back, it's also O of 1. Okay? Don't, don't have too much time to talk about this, but um, this is like, kind of like a tricky concept to understand, where the, the big O of insert is the number of elements you have to move, you have to shift downwards, not the number of elements, not just blindly O of n. Okay? Cool. Okay, so um, we're done, but um, the, the challenging ADT question is over here as well. Thanks for coming. Uh, solutions are over here.